So, welcome everyone to episode 10 of the Symphony Gear podcast, the podcast where we talk about all the action, plot twists, and lollies involved in Symphony Gear. Tonight, I am joined, as always, by the wonderful Sea Tactics, the man who was the 12th person on the moon in 1972. How are you doing tonight, Sea? I don't even know where you come up with these things. I haven't done any of that. I don't... Someone's going to like. <laughs> Like, we're going to both get, like, a billion subscribers, and somebody's going to go back and each and every one of these podcasts, and they're going to, like, make a site of just all of the things you said I've done that I've never actually done. I should go back and compile all these. I like the idea. Thank you for giving me the idea. Oh, god damn it. <laughs> this is not going to be someone. It's just going to be you. Oh, of course, because I'm the person who thinks the funniest out of anyone. Symphogear XV episode 10. Not a crude color of rust. Hibiki and Chris Chan get sent to the moon. Rather, they all do, really, I guess. Also, how yeah. about that Shimha? Am I right, fellas? Yeah, Shimha's okay, Actually, I guess. Actually, that sounds a little weird. I probably shouldn't have said that. Said it like that. <laughs> Don't worry, it's on the internet. Everyone will oh, be able to find it forever. God damn it. Oh, we also have Hibiki taking Tsubasa's hand because that's important. <gasps> Forgot about all of the uh, the Yuri stuff going on. Actually, no, I didn't. I wrote it all down. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I, a lot was, of people. I can see them, uh, like, uh, th- I can see how people could see some Yuri in it. Oh. So, yeah, we have the giant explosion thing to lead off the episode, and then it feels like this is, like, the conclusion to Fudo being an antagonist unless he somehow comes back again. It's like, they're switching over to Shemha and Miku's body. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely feels like that's the way they're going with this. Fudo, Fudo is done. Shimha is is now the, the new hotness. Yeah, and it's like Subas has like redeemed herself. She's back fighting for the heroes and not being mind controlled anymore. Which is, I mean, okay. So I think this episode, in terms of writing, this is gonna sound so weird, but but I'll explain. I think this episode has, uh, in terms of its writing and logic, has went back a couple steps. Because I think we went back to the old, like... Because this season has been really good in in fixing a lot of wrongs. Like, a lot of obvious wrongs that shouldn't have really... Shouldn't really be there wrongs. Kind of like plot hole wrongs. Uh, For Uh example, uh, at the end of the Maria and Shimha fight, uh, they're like, like, retreat, Maria. Maria's like, yes, I think I will. And I think that's literally how she said it. But (laughs) uh, Shimha... Uh, the the three the noble red is like so shall we go get them and then Shimha is like no they're gonna be dead anyway so what's the point it's another instance of the villain being dumb and letting the good guys live yeah and I guess like Shimha is like so arrogant and it's hers his whatever's power that he like does not see Maria as a threat even though Maria was able to like fight him basically with they they seem to be close in power. So that's probably also because Shemha's not at full power yet. Yeah, Shemha even commented like, "I think she used too much power to summon Yig's drill or whatever." The f- yeah, like Yigdrasil. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, that's um, a popular name in things. So. That's a popular name in things. I'm gonna name yes. my I'm gonna name my first child that. All right, you do that. I'll be proud of you. <laughs> or make fun of me, either one. I make fun of you anyway. Ah, oh, god damn it. Uh, so, so Noble Red return. Oh, no, yes. before that, before that, actually. We get a comment from Shimha after she awakened and they, they initiated a battle. Uh, Shimha mentions that, uh, like, or asks the question, is Maria a descendant of Enki? Yeah, and I have no idea what she meant by that. Me neither. Uh, but it's I important, brought... I guess. I feel like this is like I always want to like read the Wikipedia, figure out all these things, or take notes. But then I get really busy the day before day of the podcast, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ain't that true? Also, <laughs> also, there's just a bunch of like I feel like I feel like it's this is something like the people who play the mobile game probably know. Is oh yeah, I guess there's a mobile game, but I didn't think the mobile game is really like that important to the overall story. I think it's a totally different story. Like, aren't the designs and everything, like, different? I don't know. I should go play the mobile game to find out. Well, well yeah. I guess. A noble, noble Red of Return. Yes, they do. And they, like, have more power. They're able to fight Mari and basically beat her pretty easily. 
<laughs> yep. Yep. Which is there's a pretty pretty depressing scene later on where where uh, Shimha is explaining like you are you are now com- fully one hundred percent complete. And yeah, like, and that. Yeah, and then they say like, well, what was the, what was the quote? It was uh, like they'll never ever be able to be, or they'll they're, they'll never be humans again. Yeah, they became like perfect, complete monsters, which is the opposite of what they were trying to, do, and that's return to being a human. Yeah. Yeah. So we have. And yeah, it was interesting too their reaction, just how they like accepted it, feeling that this is the best way to go now, even though it's definitely very tragic considering what they've been trying to do for so long. Right. I mean, their whole thing—they've been the underdogs the whole time. They've they've wanted to get back to who they originally were, and then now that this has happened, they they have they have to accept it. I think that was their thing: is like whatever Vanessa does, they'll accept it because where else can they go now? At least that's what yeah. they think. Right, and like Vanessa's uh, accepting it too is like, it, from her perspective, she doesn't see any other options. She sees like they've lost becoming human, so why not just accept that? Yeah, and I think there's some flaws in their logic, just based off what we've seen of this season of Symphogear Gear and all of the girls, all the other girls' logic is is that I think even at one point in this episode, Vanessa says something like, "Don't you know humans and monsters can't be friends?" <laughs> Yeah, I have a note to that. Uh, Vanessa saying, "Yeah, like he be saying, you want always want to be friends. Let's do that." And then Vanessa made the comment, "Human and monsters can't be friends." It, it definitely is a flaw in their logic, but from their perspective, I th- I get where they're coming from. Right. Especially like how they've been beaten down so many times, they actually have power. They feel like they can do something now. Right. Exactly. Um, and I hope the way this ends is that these three are redeemed. And they can learn to accept who they are, and stop fighting. Yeah, on this kind of uh, time, this is getting close to the end. But when uh, Elsa was fighting uh, Sharabe and Kiriki, uh, Kiriki and Sharabe were making a comment saying like they were be able, to, like they were able to tear the walls down around them, and be accepted by others. So it's like they're trying to reach out to Elsa with the same things that they were going through three seasons ago. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Um... It's one of those instances where I feel like the story they're trying to tell with with Noble Red is that they are completely lost. And because that they can't reach their goal of being human again, that they they that there's only one thing left now, and that's just do whatever Shimha says. But in reality, I, I think is that just because they aren't physically human doesn't mean that they aren't mentally human and can't sympathize and can't i feel like they could easily integrate into society i mean yeah i yeah i could definitely see that it might be kind of hard or weird but at the same time it's info gear and that would not be completely out of what would make sense yeah and so i definitely would like to see with them uh just have like this whole redemption thing like yeah, we realized the way we were thinking was completely wrong, and now... We'll yeah, it. and Elsa was reflecting, too, on how she was always betrayed and was one day looking for a way to cure her loneliness, which she, her path for that was to become human again, and now her path like is to like destroy everything else, take the world back to how it was. And right. she even made a comment with, that just really showed her mindset, saying if she's going to be a monster, it would have been better if she never knew kindness to begin with. Yeah. I very very good moment actually um and yeah. it shows where they are mentally they're they're in a different state of mind i think at this point right and like it's easy from our perspective to say like they're wrong but everything they've gone through it make again their mindset makes sense considering what they've been through exactly they haven't been shown kindness the only kindness they've been shown is from hibiki which was just like a little moment that they were obviously confused by so yeah, it's like Kibiki is Toru from Fruits Basket. Yeah, except for more punches, more violence. Uh, yeah. More singing. More singing. But still, the same general concept is like how her kindness is able to reach out to others. Kibiki and the rest of Sifu Gear users are trying to reach out to Noble Red with kindness, but like they've been through so much they cannot accept it, at least not now. Yeah, they may have. Things get worse before they get better, I think is the saying. Yeah, that definitely. And I could see, like, they have three episodes to go. They could definitely have a redemption for Noble Red here. 
especially oh, yeah, if sure. like the other if the Sith here go users are able to like reach out to them, help them in some way. I think they'll be like the only way to defeat Sh defeat Shimha and to get Miku back is to team up. And then they yeah, all I wonder him. if I wonder if Miku will be the one to reach out to them. That would be interesting. That would definitely Cause be like, interesting. Yeah, because if Shemha doesn't have like complete control, or if she has to leave uh, Miku's body for a bit, maybe Miku could like show kindness to them. Maybe they'll like see Hibiki's kindness through Miku or something. That would be interesting. Yeah, that for sure. Very interesting what they're doing with Noble Red. Uh, you know what's weird is like this is supposed to be like Shemha's great introduction, right? We're supposed to like. I think we're supposed to feel that she's like a super ultra badass who can do pretty much anything and does whatever she wants but really i left this episode going i like noble red a lot well noble red's much more human than shemha which is intentional like. of course yes yeah because like no like shemha's like the final powerful villain but at the same time you have your humanized villains too who like they're doing bad things but you can see where they're coming from and they have an interesting story well shemha is more just a powerful entity for them to defeat yeah yeah i guess we also uh, there's a moment actually with Shimha where we see what she actually looked like, which I thought that was an interesting scene. It, it didn't feel greatly important in the grand scheme, but we know how Shimha looked. Yeah. Oh, something else interesting about Shemha, they mentioned that Shemha is words, so has the power to bring everyone together or could be seen as like language. Then she's, uh, Shemha was frustrated that uh, she could not like fully express her feelings in words. Oh yeah, that was like when she was first summoned. She was like, "Yeah, the language of the tools." Exactly. Is, is not good enough. For so me. I think. So that's definitely interesting because music is a similar thing here with its power to connect people, and you can see like music is a more powerful form of language. Yeah. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's something there for sure. Speaking of Fudo, though, there's we, we see Fudo in a prison cell, and this shot they did. I rewatched it. I rewatched this episode again today, and I'm still impressed by this shot. This shot looked great. Where they did like yeah, a I, shot through the different layers, the different blocks of the the cell he's in. Yeah. It looked. It looks. I, I said it before, but it looks something right out of JoJo. And was it actually a thing like JoJo, or is it just like that type of style? It was it was that it was it was that kind of style. It wasn't like they probably just thought of this on the fly. They didn't probably watch a JoJo episode. That were, although <laughs> they may have, but um, but no, it very much like all the lighting coming in from from the moon, the way yeah. the zoom the camera zoomed and went through the the cell bars. It was very much something like you'd see what David Productions would do. I don't know. Maybe they helped okay. with that scene. Who knows? Yeah, or maybe just someone was seeing, like, their director, who someone got creative and said, this would be cool, let's do it. Actually, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's all the shots in Stimful Gear are. Especially this season. There's just a lot of really cool shots in this season. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you made a comment when we were watching together, saying they watched JoJo, so I wrote that down. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, also, yeah. there's this great sequence where they all get back together. And Hibiki's like, he comes over and he's and she's like, yeah, all that stuff about your dad and, and all this other stuff, it's all very complicated and hard, but let's hold hands. And then... Yeah, oh, Hibiki even made a comment, too, saying she wants to think about things she cannot understand. So in a way, that's like showing her trying to grow, because mentally, she's kind of simple, but it's like she wants to learn more. She wants to understand more, especially about her friends. Right. She wants, she wants to understand her perspective and what she went through rather than closing off because she made a mistake which I right. could say Tsubasa really never made a mistake here she was brainwashed but it still shows Hibiki's kindness and open open mindedness to realize something like this and try to understand her perspective yeah, and it was, well, Subasa was brainwashed. We were talking about this before but it's not like a complete brainwash it's like pushing you toward a direction you kind of want to go anyway Right, right, exactly. And that, that may be part of that as well. Uh, yeah, but which then, is definitely an interesting way to do it because it like, limits the power and makes it fitting for the characters to still do the things they're doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Hibiki took Tsubasa's hand, which was cool, and hand-holding. Yeah. And then all the girls are like, 
yeah, hold hands. And then Chris is like, we've all held hands with this dummy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've held hands with him. He knows you're... <laughs> I just love that because... Uh, I rewatched some of season two of Symphogear, which the first episode was really focusing on Chris and Hibiki's like relationship a little bit in the first episode. Mm-hmm. And Hibiki and Chris have this kind of relationship where really it's like the it's just Chris being a tsundere. Yeah. <laughs> and Hibiki is just like just really, really likes Chris. And we saw it in this season when when Miku and Hibiki were taking that bath together. Uh, they they made a the Chris reference in that, and I think that shows how important how important of a person Chris is to Hibiki. Yeah, like how how much Hibiki like values Chris, even if we don't see it directly much. Yeah, and we saw in the the second or third episode. Chris also values them as well. Yeah, so you can definitely see they care about each other. So this was like Chris's way of showing like how much he cares about Hibiki and Tsubasa. I just, I just love it. She calls Hibiki a dummy. <laughs> exactly, and Hibiki loves it. She accepts it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got to that part. We have, uh, we got the backstory of like what happened to Noble Red, how they're killed and then revived. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, that didn't really surprise me because I thought it'd be very strange to kill off like three important characters like that without like any build up or to make it feel proper. Yeah. We said last, uh, well, I said last episode, I, I thought at least two of them were going to come back. So we got all of them. Yeah, which, yeah, again, like, Simple Gear is not a show to kill people off for no reason, especially for important characters like that. Yeah, usually always leads to Deus Ex Machina, because, you know, it's still Simple well, Gear. It's not the greatest writing ever. Well, I mean, it makes sense that Shemha is a god after all, so having, like, the plot device from a god to solve it, I, I'll accept it. Yeah, it's it's fun. Like, uh, it's not gonna win any awards, I guess. Well, this season may be the most likely to win a reward or an award. All right, it'll win one of my awards this because they're mine and I can do what I want. Exactly, exactly, completely arbitrary, like awards. Yes, or just I just hope people will go vote for my award, but only shared on the Symphogear podcast. Symphogear podcast is the best podcast. You all should subscribe. Yep, it's almost as good as the Fruits Basket podcast. This is true. This is true. Uh, so they need a space shuttle to get to the moon because of Balel or whatever. Yeah, the Curse of Baal or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, they also have Which... like, like a tower thing. I'm not sure. What... Yeah, the Yggdrasil thing, we don't really get what that is, but it's like a giant thing, so I guess we'll, it'll probably play a role. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure what that is. Someone in the comments, please tell us what, what that really represents. Uh, we should ask uh, Francesca. She would know. Ah, uh, yes. Francesca. Yes. Even though it's not Chris Basket, she would still know. She's not. In, I don't think she's in the live chat. I don't think she's either. I'll, I'll message her later. <laughs> Do you know what this thing in Sifo Gear is? And then she just looks at me weird. Yep, probably. Um, oh yeah, so they're going to the moon. Uh, it was like a rocket ship or something. President of America. yeah, it's interesting. The U.S. help out. Like, yeah, it's like the U.S. helping out and the rocket from Fudo together, and then the Pacific users are protecting it. Mm-hmm. And this is another example of where I think the logic just goes a little bit backwards and more than one step. Uh, they, they, the, the, of course, they obviously attack the space shuttle. Uh, to which I'm like, wait. Hold on a minute. You said let them go. They're going to die anyway. So why are you trying to stop them now? If it doesn't unless, matter. Unless they figured out that by going to the moon, they could pose a threat. But like uh, Shemha did not think of that before. Yeah, th- there was no scene rectifying that initial decision she made. It's just they showed up to attack. So I'm left here wondering what the logic of, of this initial scene was of having her of having this initial reaction, why not incapacitate Maria to an extent where she can't yeah, get away? Yeah, or let's just make sure that she can't do anything. Right, right. It's just very, I don't know, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And not only that, they destroyed the space shuttle. And, right. And at this point, I'm like, oh, crap, they are fucked. Like, they can't go to space. There's there's nothing they can do. They'll, they'll never go to the moon. And then they pull out this weird thing where they're like, 
and this is how we'll get to the moon. And then Subasa's is like, nah, uh. And then they drop and then Subasa, it. Subasa like takes it. Uh, I think she swipes at it, and then for some reason they let go of it and they drop it, and they all teleport. Yeah, and like it, it does not make sense for them to use a teleporter to get to the moon when they're like near an enemy. They don't have to get to the moon. They should like use it the teleporter to get back to their base and then from there go to the moon. Yeah, it's very. The logic here was was unav to me it was unavoidable. I don't know about you or the other viewers, but to me it was it was not a good moment. Yeah, it's like they needed to get to the moon, but they they like just did not line stuff up, so they had to force it. Yeah, that's really what it felt like. It felt like they wrote themselves into a corner. Yeah, and something else that with the earlier in the season, with the villains being underdogs, they could lose so many battles, and then typically, you, if the villain wins a battle, they'd want to like kill the heroes, take them out or something. But for Sinfo Gear, you can't have that, so they'd have to retreat. But in this case, by having the heroes always win, you force the villains to retreat, so that makes sense logically. But here, with the villains being so strong, they kind of lost that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think they could have done this whole episode better in general. Uh, yeah. Just from changing a few things, I think the 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 story they had here was really what they were trying to do is like we have to set up them going to the moon. That's the next step, but we don't have enough here, so we got to create a little bit of a problem to solve. And I just felt like they could have done something. They could have had a whole a whole episode that just slowed things down and and just had a mo you know had some moments where we talk. I don't I don't think we needed much action in this episode because. We you have come off so much action before, right? And then in the next three episodes or so, we're gonna get tons of action. So I yeah, felt like sure. we could have afforded to slow down here a little bit, but yeah, especially like they seem to be cramming a lot of story into the season. So this might be where it's like too much for it to handle. Right. Right. Yeah. I could have done without this episode almost completely. <laughs> really. Well, no. There's one part that I'm glad that they had. What is that? The lollies wishing they could go to the moon. Oh yeah, they were like, I think Shirabe was like, Kirika, I wish I, you know, I was secretly wishing this whole time we could go to the moon. Yes, yeah, like, that line was just so great. <laughs> it's so funny because like, why would you wish that random thing? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, goofy. like, if I got, I'd like to go to the moon too. It's not really a secret, but it's like it's not something that I normally. Station. They're just goofy. They're goofy. Yeah. Like I, I think I said before, like they're the most self-aware part of the show because they, they see all these stupid things that really fit. <laughs> that Honestly, you know what? When I was actually watching this, I'm like, before the, they even mentioned that, because they were like, you know, being all goofy looking and being all cheerful and stuff, and childlike. I was like, they're going to say something about the moon, aren't they? <laughs> That's literally what I thought. I was like... Yes, they're you know definitely them so gonna well. mention it. It's just that's what the show's taught us. I think is these two characters, like you said, they're the most self-aware. Well, the blah, 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 the most self-aware part of the show. It's like they're having the most fun with the story that they're given. Pretty much. Uh, also, Shirabe's transformation. Once again, she says, "Kill." Yeah, okay. she says, "Kill." <laughs> yeah, she's not as expressive with her enjoyment of killing as the death lolly, but she's still pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, they were like, they were like, we're being attacked, and then Kirika's like, death. Exactly. Like, she got a couple of those in this episode. She just reacts with death. I mean, and if I said that, then people would think I was weird. Exactly. But they probably because it is weird. But that's beside the point. For them, it's just completely normal. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so then the noise, and which we kind of expected the noise to show up because that's just how Sinfo Gear works. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The noise at this point to me, I it just, I think it was like season two. I was like, the noise are actually useless here. Yeah, it's like they might be a little bit of a threat, but you know that's not going to be like the main danger. They just like need cannon fodder t for cool action. Yeah, that's really what they just need those. They need fodder. So that they can do their cool, like, signature moves. Jump the right. run with, like, whatever. Yeah. I, I will not complain about thriller villains when the moves are that cool. But then we got uh, uh, Shirabe and Kiriki doing their transformation to that other form, which name I never remember. Amalgam. Yeah, Amalgam. There it is. 
Yeah. And that gave them the power to fight Elsa and the others. Right. They went Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan. Exactly. Have we? They probably explained how this where this power came from, but I don't think I ever understood it. So, but still, it looked cool. It's like some unawakened form, I think. They're just Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan. It's just they've ascended to the next level of Saiyan. Yeah, maybe I should just like take a look on the wiki after this podcast. Watch that episode of Dragon Ball Z where Goku goes Super Saiyan. There you go. I think I've seen it. Krillin died, and those lollies were like, well, got to use Amalgam for Krillin. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Krillin's probably just one of the random background characters that dies every episode. He died. I think he died once. I thought it was twice. He may have died twice, but uh, I mean, yeah, I think he... everybody's died at least a couple times, maybe in Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, because I know he died during the Frieza arc. Yeah, he explodes and... into bits. And I think it was one like uh, early on in Dragon Ball Z. Oh, uh, you may be thinking of Yamcha. No, I know Yamcha died. Uh, he, Vegeta killed him. But I was pretty sure Krillin died another time before that, too. Because, like, that was the first time they were using Dragon Ball to bring someone back to life. Mm. Maybe. It's uh, been a while since I've seen Dragon Ball. <laughs> if somebody wants to, um... Somebody wants, like, to know Hibiki's waist size... <laughs> oh, yes! You know that I... now. You know her oh, yeah, measurements. <laughs> Yeah, I should have gone back and like seen what that was, but I remember you mentioning it. It's the most ridiculous. <laughs> she to grab onto Hibiki, Vanessa shoots from her arm, measuring tape. Okay, that's what it was. To grab her waist, and Hibiki, of course, blushes and is like, "Oh, huh?" <laughs> Does her normal Aoi Yuki noises and. I think Yuki's uh, good at making noises. <laughs> She's really good as Hibiki. She's sadly Tamaki and Fire Force, which is... Every uh, time I hear Tamaki and Fire Force, I'm like, this ain't right. This ain't right. You are Hibiki, we should, you imposter. We should have her as part of the Simple Gear podcast. I agree. We should get her We should get her onto this podcast. That'd be and she doesn't have to understand English. She can just make Hibiki noises. Uh, it, she, should, she could just randomly say things Hibiki have said. Exactly. Just just go, ah! And something about, um, I forget what, what is her thing that she says? Even so, or that may be true, but I'll fight anyway. <laughs> just, you know, stuff people would say in Shonen. Exactly. This is kind of a Shonen. Yeah, it's got sh- it's got a lot of Shonen elements, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, yeah basically it's a Shonen magical girl show uh, with inspiration from absurd anime. Everything. It's so it's inspirations everywhere. This anime exactly. is crazy. Uh but yeah, so And then they took the teleporter to the moon and now we have no on confused. I love their reactions. Chris was like, is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just they're on the moon now. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, we like we knew that they were going to the moon in some way just because they've been foreshadowing so much. So for the viewer, it's not that big of a surprise. But then we have like uh, Chris and Nemesis who are like, "Wait, we're on the moon now? How did this happen?" <laughs> As I went trying, just remember, you're in simple gear. This is normal. <laughs> I do like it. I wish there was a character. Next episode, there should be a character that says like, "Of course we'd be on the moon." We've done so much. Like, this is, of course we'd be here. No, I waited for Kirikou to say, yay, we made it to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> or whichever Lolly said that. Oh, my. Like, I got, I got my wish come true. And they're just like, wait, do you wish to go to the moon? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be. Otherwise, I will be really disappointed. Yeah, they have to have some self-aware stuff, like referencing, yes, we made it to the moon. We are on the moon now. Or like maybe like a character is hoping to get some moon rocks and is glad she finally has a chance to or something. <laughs> she no, the whole the whole time like she's trying to pick up moon rocks and 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 then Shirabe is like here Kirika put that down we have to we have to fight and, and Kirika's like I don't want to put it down. <laughs> or no, they found it, find another phone on the room and they try to call the phone from last year. I'm still utterly confused where that phone came from. <laughs> Me too, but I'm glad it was there. Oh, God. Such a weird sequence that was. So this, I could just see someone like putting it in without like anyone else knowing. 
It's like, wait, why am I saying that? Who put this on here? Not too late to change it, just to say the line. That's also like a moment where there is kind of self aware. Like, let's just, we need this to happen here. Let's just put it there because it's going to be funny. Yes, it's if Gary knows what it wants to do. Also, the fact it was connected by a cord. <laughs> exactly. It's not even a cell phone, it's just a normal. Like, like... They could have tr- traced the cord literally. <laughs> oh, also, XP subscribed to me, so thank you, XP. Oh, yeah. XP joined the server today. Yes, welcome, XP. Also, uh, everyone, go join the server that's in the Discord that is C's, and then we talk about things like Simple Gear and Fruits Basket and uh, other weird topics. Yeah, uh, like who has the best turkey sandwich? No, I want a turkey. Actually, I had a turkey sandwich for lunch today. It was good. It's good to hear. Turkey sandwiches are are a treat, a delight. Yes, and now I need water. So, um, any other thoughts on the episode as a whole? Why is Maria my girlfriend? You say that every episode. Well, I think me saying it now, I think it means more than when I said it the first several million times. Okay, well, watch one day you'll get a girlfriend named Maria and everything will be happy. If I do, that's going to be weird because my cousin's wife is named Maria. I mean, my uh, sister's boyfriend has the same name as our dad. Interesting. It gets confusing sometimes. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I, um, don't, so I don't you... have anything else to say. I think we went through most everything, though. Yeah. Overall, I definitely liked it. It seemed like more of a setup episode, so if the rest of the three are good, then I'll definitely be happy with the series as a whole. Yeah, besides some of the logic, it was a solid episode. It wasn't anywhere near as good as the last three or four episodes, but this is probably yeah. the weakest episode of the season. Not because it is a bad episode, just because of some of the logic things. Yeah, and there wasn't as much to stand out with this episode, even for all the explosions and stuff. That's kind of standard for Sinfo Gear. Yeah, the only thing that stood out was Maria. And Maria is just Maria. And she's not my girlfriend for some reason. Yeah, exactly. That's why you're going to drop the show. No, I don't want to. All right, you, that should be a reason why you drop Fire Force, is because Maria is not your girlfriend. Hey, if you guys want to see an epic rant on Fire Force, go check out King of Anime Podcast. Yep, I joined and said things and she did not notice. You did? Hi! Oh my god. Anyways, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> yep, and I'm out of things to say too, other than just our random banter. But we normally say that for outside of podcast Discord calls. Yes. So... So thank you everyone for watching. We will be back uh, next week with episode 11. I am in the process of uploading the VODs for the last three episodes. We had some audio issues, but they're, they're still fun. We still talk about Simpho Gear, so go check those out. Yes. And yes, Simpho Gear is amazing. You should all watch it, even though I'm pretty sure if you are watching this, you've already seen it. Yes. And I think C is broken, so we'll be ending the podcast now. Uh, C, tell people where they can find you. Yes. And by that, uh, C means go check the description because there's a link to his YouTube, his Twitter, uh, and his Discord there. Actually, there's not a link to his Twitter, but I'm sure you're smart enough to find it. Yes. So, so thank you, everyone, for watching, and we will talk to you next time. Yes.